is the storyline of the Bible. So everything we were talking about of, of the intentionality and the way the Bible was constructed and composed, it's all very intentional to, to present a story, a message. And that's really um, the field of um, poetics. Poetics, not, not referring to poetry, but poetics refers to um, the intentional crafting of literature. So um, for at least my generation, the way you learn to write a paper is you write a, an introduction paragraph, you write a conclusion paragraph, and then you have three body paragraphs. Like that's the first way you learn how to write a paper. And in your introduction, you have an introduction sentence, a conclusion sentence, and then three body sentences. And your introduction, um, three body sentences, each sentence introduces what your body paragraphs are going to be talking about. So that's poetics. That's just intentional crafting to communicate something. So the Bible in its intentional crafting is trying to communicate something. So this session is what is the storyline of the Bible. So I'm going I'm to switch this screen over real quick to a drawing pad. If you'd like to draw along with me, that would be really fun, and I welcome you to do that. Um, but we're going we're gonna to be doing some drawings. So if you want to start by drawing three boxes, you could do that. Let me lock this. There we go. OK. So our first box is going to be the Torah. Our second box is going to be Oh man, how do you spell prophets? It's been a long day. <laughs> prophets? Yeah, cool. And then our last box is going to be the writings. We're thinking through how the Bible presents the Bible, especially how Jesus um, learned and read his Old Testament Bible. So the Torah starts with Genesis, <clears throat> and we're going to think about uh, Genesis 1 to 11 real quick. So this first little box up here is Genesis 1 to 11. And the way Genesis 1 to 11 starts off is, is God creates a, a, a fantastic piece of land. I mean, ideal real estate. He plants some trees, a nice garden, and then he also sets up these two people. And their names are... Adam and Eve. Adam, which means human. And then uh, Eve's name in, yeah. Oh, <laughs> Eve's name in Hebrew is um, Chava, which means life. So Eve, her name means life. And that's probably really small up there, huh? Nice. But you're introduced to um, humanity and life. That's how like the Bible starts off. It, it's got establishing hum humanity and life. And Ariana has a question. Oh, I was just trying to ask if humanity Yeah, I could do that, I guess. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Is that better? Yeah. Cool. Okay. All right, you're really going to test my drawing skills now. And if you notice, they have little crowns. And the reason I gave them little crowns, those are supposed to be crowns, by the way. There we go. The reason they have crowns is because they're made in the image of God. And what it means to be made in the image of God, in, in the A-N-E, the ancient Near Eastern context, the only people who would call themselves images of God are kings. But the Bible starts off by saying humanity is made in the image of God meaning they're kings and queens of creation. And what they're, they're, they're set in charge of is the earth. And they're set to rule over the earth, subdue it, and be fruitful and multiply and fill God's creation. So from page one of the Bible, you're introduced to a God who brings order out of chaos and who forms humanity, and he wants to rule over his creation through humanity. He actually wants to establish a human king and have the hu humans reign over his creation as his representatives on earth as he is in heaven. That's how the Bible starts, and that's the goal of the Bible. 
But as we know, there's that pesky little snake that comes into the garden and begins to talk to Eve rather than Adam. And Adam is so passive and he doesn't really say anything. And what happens in the story is, is things just really go downhill real quick. You have this story of this, uh, of this brother and, and another brother, and they're killing each other. They're stoning each other to death. And then there's this guy who's a king. His name is Lemek, and he, he acquires women as property, and he sings songs about getting vengeance. And, and from the very first start of, of humanity and life, of Adam and Eve, the moment they don't trust God to provide what is good for them, and, and they seize autonomy for themselves to define what is good and evil in their own eyes, things begin to spiral out of control. So the, the way we're introduced to the story is, is they're offered this choice from God. They can listen to him for, to determine what is good and right and, and rule on God's behalf, or they can seize autonomy for themselves, define good and bad for their own terms, and, and leave God out of the project. And what happens is humanity chooses autonomy over the creator God, and that just sends everything into a spiral. So there's, there's Cain and Abel, there's Lamech, and then there's that story of the boat. Remember that one? And the reason why there is a boat in the first place is because every human that has filled the earth is evil and wicked all the time, and it grieves God. It says God is grieved, and so he brings about a flood to start over with Noah. But then what happens with Noah? Well, he gets plastered drunk in his tent, and then some sketchy things happen in the tent between him and his son, and really nothing has changed about humanity. And it all lands them in Genesis 11, in this story about the building of something. Anyone? The building of what? Yeah, the, the Tower of Babel, which is Babylon. So the story of Genesis 1 to 11, the way it's crafted is it starts with, uh, with humanity and life, and it's story after story of them not listening, not trusting God, and instead determining what's right for themselves, and where it lands them is them trying to build themselves up to the reputation of God, a tower to the heavens in Babylon. That's where the story of Genesis 1 to 11 takes us. So then the story of Genesis continues, and out of Babylon, God calls this guy named Abram. Maybe he's got a beard, right? And a staff, because he's probably a shepherd, you know? This is Abram. Abram. Good guy, bad guy. Do, okay, both. Yeah, do good guys um, hand their wives over to be sexually abused by, by kings to protect their own life? No. Do good guys uh, sexually abuse their Egyptian slave to, to seize the promise of God for themselves? No. <laughs> so good guy, bad guy. Human. He's just following in family footsteps. He's just a human. We, we already know what to expect out of humans because we've been told from Genesis 1 to 11 what human and life is all about. It's about people not trusting God. So the majority of, of Abraham's time is just him totally blowing it. But back in Adam and Eve, there was this word that was used. God, God did something for them. He um, blessed them. He said, be fruitful and multiply. He blessed them, and that blessing was supposed to expand God's rule and his kingdom over uh, the entire earth. But of course, they rejected that. But when he calls Abram out of Babylon, in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, he gives a promise to Abraham. He says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to curse those who curse you. And, and through you, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. So it's like we're zooming in on, on what was supposed to happen for all of humanity. We now know it's going to happen through this family of Abraham. So now we're just watching the family of Abraham throughout the rest of the Bible. And, and Abraham, for the most part, 
does not do a very good job, but there are a few moments where he is successful, where he's the good guy. And one of those moments is when he's invited outside of his tent in the middle of the night, and he's getting pretty old, and God said he's going to have some children with, with Sarah, he's going to have a son, and he's like in his 90s, he's like, hey God, like where, uh, where's the kid at? And God says, look up at all the stars. And Abraham, Abraham looks up, and, he said, and God tells him, try to count all those stars if you can do it. Try to count those stars. Your offspring are going to be more numerous than the stars of the heavens. And it says, Abraham believed him. He trusted him, and it was counted to him as righteousness. He had faith. And it's in this small moment when Abraham is old, he's at the end of himself, and there's nothing that he can do to bring about the promises of God on his own. And he's at the end of himself, and all he does is he stops doing, and he trusts God. And it's in that moment that he's called righteous by God. Well, now we're following this family, and, the, and Abraham has uh, a son named Isaac. Isaac has a son named Jacob. Oops. How do I go back from that? There we go. Jacob, pro- Jacob probably doesn't have a beard because he's a man of smooth skin, but Isaac probably did have a beard, yeah. But Isaac, or Jacob's kind of a deceitful little guy, and he... You know, tricks people off birthrights. He tricks his father into giving him a blessing. But at the end of the day, he begins to trust God to be his own God. And he has 12 sons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. There we go. And these 12 sons of Jacob who gets renamed to Israel, or the 12 tribes of Israel, they find themselves going down into the land called Egypt. So we're just going to draw a little pyramid. They weren't, they weren't where the pyramids were, just so we know, but that indicates that they're in Egypt for us. So down in Egypt, it's the Nile. The family of Israel begins to grow to a, a number so great. As generation after generation goes, uh, it gets to a point where there's so many that the Pharaoh of Egypt enslaves these people. And he enslaves these people because he doesn't want them to become an enemy. But then God hears the cries of his people, and he raises up uh, this little baby named Moses. And the way you're introduced to Moses is he's a little baby who cannot do anything for himself, and he passes through the waters to be delivered by God, and then finds himself in Pharaoh's court, and he grows up to be a young, a young man. He's trained in, in many ways. So we meet this guy Moses. Moses, good guy or bad guy? Bad guy. <laughs> oh, he does good things, right? He does a lot of good things. All right, human. He's a human. The first thing you learn about Moses is that he strikes down an Egyptian. He murders an Egyptian in a hot anger. And you're not told how to think about that. You're just told that he murders him, and then he flees out into the land of Midian, and that's where he, he meets God at Mount Sinai. He meets Jethro and his wife. But the first thing you find out about Moses is that he's a murderer. You're not told how to think about that. But then it's this murderer who who God raises up and sends back into Egypt to deliver the people of Israel. So the nation of Israel, like they're big now. Now they're rescued out of the land, and they go to a mountain where God encounters them. He's like, hey, I want to enter into a covenant with you. And there's like flashes of lightning, and they're all standing around the mountain. They're like, we want to do everything. We want to be your people. We want you to be our God. And they're following Moses this entire time. And, and, and it's here that they enter into that covenant that we were talking about earlier. God has rescued uh, sinful and broken humanity because he wants to bless them. He, he wants to continue what he started on page one and two of Genesis, where he's going to fill the earth and rule all of his creation through a human representative as a king over his creation and bring about blessing for his creation. So the nation of Israel continues on, and they get lost in the wilderness because they're kind of crappy people. Go figure, they're humans. Um, But the story continues, and they go to this place called the land of Canaan. We're going to draw it real quick. Just go like that. There we go. There's our, our land of Canaan. And they go 
on this side, and they enter in through the waters. They go through the waters of the Jordan River into the land of Canaan. And that's the Torah, where we're waiting for this human who's going to bring about God's blessing, because we're following the family of Abraham. We know God's going to bless all the families of the earth through Abraham, and we're waiting for God to restore this. The only problem is humans are so fickle and messed up. So then we're in the prophetic literature. And the prophets start with Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. So this is going to be, the top is going to be Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. And here's how the story goes. They're brought into an awesome piece of land. I mean, like, such a good piece of land. They're set up. God says, you just, you know, drive them out, subdue the land, subdue the land by pushing out the inhabitants of, of Canaan and every land that your feet step on, I'm going to give to you. Just trust me. And what happens in the story from Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings is things do not go very good. Oops. And things just spiral out of control. And the way 2 Kings ends is they're in exile in Babylon. Are we seeing it? Brought into an awesome piece of land. Established to rule and to subdue but then hum- humans do what's right in their own eyes and make their own decisions, and it lands them in Babylon. Humans brought into an amazing piece of land, but then they're doing what's right in their own eyes, and it spirals out of control, and they land in Babylon. The, the story of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings is just a way more intense version of Genesis 1 through 11. Like you're already introduced to this story after you've read the first 11 pages of your Bible. You know how the story of humanity and life is going to go over and over and over again. But this story uh, from Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, there's these key figures that we keep running into over and over again. Um, one of the key figures that we keep running into are these people called kings. Lots of stories about kings. Maybe we should give them him a yellow crown. Yeah, there we go. Lots of stories about kings. Some of the kings, okay. Some of the kings, horrible. David, good guy or bad guy? Human, good, yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes he brings the ark out from the, uh, from the land that it was taken captive by the Philistines, and he's throwing a party, he's wearing an ephod, and he's doing all these priestly things, making sacrifices and dancing before the Lord. Other times he's murdering a best friend to take his wife and sleep with her. Like, ooh, not great example of how you should live. There's also stories about um, not just uh, kings, but about these people named prophets. And they're usually rebuking the kings and telling them what they should not be doing and that they're disobeying God. And these prophets, they come on the scene and they're calling out against, God, against God's people. They're like, no, stop. No. <laughs> and then we also have lots of stories about these people called priests. an ephod. He wears a little crest and crown. He's got a little turban. And you keep hearing story after story of kings, of prophets, and of priests. Sometimes they do what is good. Sometimes they do what is bad. And and what's interesting uh, is that all of those roles, they're rooted back in the people that we saw earlier. So Moses here and Abraham, and even Adam, all have these three components to them. At one point, Moses is called, oops, Moses is called a king by the people. He doesn't call himself a king, but he's called a king in Deuteronomy 33, I think. Uh, Moses is most certainly a prophet, right? He's called um, a prophet of God. He's a servant of God, and they're waiting for a prophet like Moses. 
And also, he does priestly things all the time. Before he establishes Aaron as, as the priest, he's interceding for the people and making sacrifice. He actually intercedes for Aaron so that Aaron can begin to serve as a priest. So Moses serves this prophetic, yet kingly, yet priestly role. Same thing with Abraham. Uh, Abraham is called a prophet of God by people in the story. And uh, he's also uh, doing priestly things. He's always going up on high places and building an altar and making a sacrifice. Uh, and he's the one who's carrying the blessing of God. And remember in Genesis 14 when he fights all those kings and beats them? Like he goes to war with 10 different kings and smokes the floor with them. I mean, that sounds to me like he's some sort of kingly figure. He's even called a prince in the narrative. Adam and Eve... They're made in the image of God. They're, they're told to rule over the earth. Kings rule. That's the verb that kings do. But then Adam was also made, and he's given a command by God, and it's his job to teach that command to his wife Eve after she's formed from his side. That's a prophetic role, to carry the word of God. But they're also made to work and to keep the garden. That's what priests do in the temple. So Adam was made to be this royal, priestly, prophetic figure by trusting God. And that's what was lost. So this entire time, we've been waiting for this like prophet, king, priest person. But now they're all divided into these different roles. And we're watching the story just get more and more out of control. And then we have the former prophets. But, and what the former prophets are doing is, is they are... Um, linking into this story that we're looking at. So Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, uh, Ezekiel, the 12 minor. Uh, remember how Abraham had three sons and then 12? Uh, so just real quick, there's, there's three sons, or three, there's the three of them, and then there's the 12. There's three major prophets, and then there's 12 minor prophets. Three and 12. All right. Cool. Um, but they just keep talking, and they, they, they take these moments from the story of where these, these people shined. The moments when they had faith, and they believed God, like on those one occasions. When, when David led the ark out on those one occasions. And what they begin to do is they're um, basically constructing a help-wanted sign. Like, who's this person going to be? He needs to be a human. You know what we need? Deuteronomy 18? We need a prophet who's like Moses. That's what we need. And when we keep going, what the latter prophets do, so down here, what the latter prophets begin to do, is they begin to rebuke the nation of Israel. And, and they use this um, metaphor all throughout it. Oops, I'm on the wrong layer. Okay change my layer. They talk about the city of Jerusalem, the old city of Jerusalem. And as they talk about the city, they, they rebuke them for all the corrupt um, things that are taking place in the city by the kings, by these evil and wicked kings that have risen up. People like Jeroboam, they're like, man, Jeroboam sucks because they're evil and wicked. Grr. And they talk about how God is going to do something to restore what has happened in the, in the brokenness of humanity and how God's going to bring about a refining fire. Think about the end of the book of Malachi. He's going to bring about a refining fire that's going to change this. It's called the Day of the Lord. Day of the Lord. Doddle. God's going to do a new thing. He's going to change things. And he's going to make a new Jerusalem a new city, a new community of the people of God. NJ. Not New Jersey, New Jerusalem. If it was New Jersey, that would have been a bummer. My parents are from New Jersey. That's why that's funny. Okay. So he's going to set up a new Jerusalem. It's going to be beautiful. And he's going to set up a new king. And all throughout the prophetic literature, there's this hope of God raising up a human 
like Moses was on that one time, or like David was on that one time, the human that we need to fix this human problem. And as we're going through it, the, the prophets never use a name. They use metaphors like branch or servant or shepherd. But there's actually only one name that's ever given uh, to this person. And the name that's given to him oops, is David. They call him David. Now, the prophets who are writing, like Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, who talk about a new David to come, they're writing like hundreds of years after David has died. But they're talking about David like he was on that one time. As they keep making their help wanted sign, they're like, we need a new David is what we need. We want and we need a David. We need a Moses. What we need is a human. So as that story continues, that's what they're anticipating. That's what they're waiting for, is someone who's going to come and bring about the blessing of God. They're going to be a king, but also a priest. But they're going to be a prophet who speaks the word of God, and they're going to be the one who brings about the day of the Lord and bring about the new Jerusalem, the new community of God, led by our king, led by our new David. Oh my goodness, what is going on? There we go. Our new David. So that's why when we get to um, the New Testament, Jesus gets onto the scene and he's doing priestly stuff. He's going around forgiving people of their sins. Uh, He's saying the kingdom of God is at hand, has drawn near. Usually you draw near to the temple, but now he's like, hey, the temple has drawn near to you. In Matthew Matthew 12, he says, um, something greater than the temple is here. Jesus' favorite name for himself was Son of Man. That's another way of saying human. Jesus is the human one who, who's come to restore this storyline. The writings are a, a, a conglomeration of, of all of these pieces that, that go back into the story and, and examine how do you, as a follower of God, how do you fit into the story? How do you live in such an unfaithful time? And the, the first story, um, the first book is the Psalms. And they have a little introduction of Psalm 1 and 2. And what is Psalm 1 about? Like, what is the command of Psalm 1 telling you to do? Anyone? We read it together. Meditate yeah, meditate on this story right here. That's what Psalm 1 is about. And what is that story about? Well, it's about God establishing humans and wanting to rule through humanity, but humans being so fickle and fed up in their own mind that they won't trust God. And and the need is for someone to come along who's like Moses and like Abraham in those moments of faith when they trust God. We're waiting for a human to come along and restore the Genesis 1 and 2 image. Then we know we're anticipating not just a prophet, but someone who is a king. And what is Psalm 2 about? It's about the son of humanity. It's about a human one coming along and being that king that we need and all the nations bowing down to the king. And what are all the Psalms about? They're about a David figure and his, his sufferings, and then his exaltations of, of going through lament and then entering into glory. The way uh, Chronicles ends, the last book in the Bible uh, of this ordering is Chronicles. And the way Chronicles ends right here is it says, um, go and build a temple. Go and build a temple. The place where God dwells with people. But the temple has already been rebuilt. But that's how the Bible ends. And there's this hope and anticipation that God is going to make a new Jerusalem one day. The story is not yet over. But then you have other books like the, the story of Ruth in here. And what's Ruth about? Ruth is about, well, it starts off, it says, in the day of the judges. And you're like, oh, yeah, in those days when it was really messy, when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And how does it end? It's a genealogy about David about how Ruth, this Moabite woman, who the Moabites fought against the Israelites, how now God is restoring that to bring about this new David figure. 
So it's all hyperlinking back into these stories about how what we need is a human to come and to be the king and the prophet and the priest that we need. When you get to the New Testament, you read Matthew. And how does Matthew start off his story? Well, it's with a genealogy. And the way he goes through his genealogy is he breaks it up into three sections, and they're pretty simple. He starts with... Uh, son of Abraham, Abraham, and then he says, son of David. It's like how you're introduced to Jesus. Jesus Christ, son of Abraham, son of David. He breaks up the entire story into that. And the genealogies are, go from Abraham to David to exile, which is Babylon, in Babylon, and then to Jesus. This entire story has, has been trying to lead us to our need for a human, to, to trust God and to be faithful. And it's by his faithful obedience that then we are made righteous because he's a sacrifice for us. So that's how the, the storyline uh, presents and unfolds this. Is, uh, it's a story. It's a narrative that, that plays out before our eyes. Uh, which is a very different approach than being like, okay, I'm just going to flip to the verse of the day. I'm going to hear what it says like for me in this moment. Like Maybe it's like one of the verses in Joshua 1 where it's like, be courageous, be courageous, be courageous. You're like, all right, I need to be courageous on my drive to work and not be mean to people. You know, something like that. But it's a story about God blessing humanity through one who is a, a king and a priest and a prophet but it's also a, a story that, that holds up a mirror to us and shows us our own brokenness. These, these people are not moral models. These are moral mirrors for us, showing us our brokenness of when we don't trust God. So that's the, the, the sto- kind of the big picture story. Uh, we're going to take a short break. Um, just go to the bathroom, and everyone's going to close down with a really short session of like, okay, well, if this is like the big story, what's the point of the story? Like, What's the story trying to tell us? Um, So take a a five-minute break, and then we'll be back together.